<clears throat> Greetings, my name is Lucas Mann, and I pastor the Spring Church in Lawrence, South Carolina, just a few minutes down the road here, uh, about five minutes off of exit uh, nine there. And uh, I come out here this, this afternoon to bring to you the gospel of grace, uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, friends, I understand from Scripture, the Bible, the Word of God, that man has fallen short. He has sinned. He has rebelled against God and he is at enmity with God. And all people are in that state by default. And you yourselves, if you do not know Christ, are in that state. And so I know that Scripture says the only remedy for this, this colossal issue, this great dilemma... It's found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. For our sin earns us the wrath of God against it. Our sin earns us an eternity in hell. That's where we are headed by default. But God being rich in mercy sent His Son into the world to die for His people. And He rose again. Friends, do not trample the blood of Christ underfoot for God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. You must understand this. You must deal with this truth. You must deal with this holy God. You must. And so I plead with you today, I come out here to plead with you concerning your soul that you would repent and that you would believe the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of grace. The gospel of the glory of God. And ultimately, I come out here to bring God the glory through the preaching of the gospel of His Son. To exalt the triune God who for His own glory made all things. And for, who, and for His own praise, He created you and me. We were built and designed to worship Some people created by God have been made vessels of wrath, others vessels of mercy. But that is the chief end of man, to bring God glory. So may God be glorified as the gospel goes forth today. And may you be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of your own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. For that is the only justifying righteousness. Any other so-called righteousness is not a saving righteousness. It's a pseudo-righteousness. The text of scripture, scripture that I would like to direct your attention to this afternoon, the Scripture that I would like to explain is found in Romans chapter 4. In Romans chapter 4, in verse 5, Paul is here discussing salvation and how one is saved, how one is reconciled to God and saved from hell and given entrance into heaven. What could be more important, friends, than our souls and our eternal salvation? And Paul is dealing with these weighty, these important issues. He says in verse 5, but to the one who does not work, but believes in Him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. And that's what I want to explain this afternoon. Salvation, not by the work of man, but by the work of God. By the work of God toward man. It is not the effort of men. Friends, when we conceive of the work of Christ, His death, His burial, His resurrection, the question is asked, how do I take ownership of this? How is this applied to me? Is it something that I, by my own strength and power, grab hold of? Is it something that I have to work my way up to? Or is it something that God bestows upon me? something that God gives me as I rest and rely upon His power? I tell you, the latter answer is the correct one. Salvation is of the work of God. God justifies the ungodly, as this text clearly says. And that is what I want to preach on this afternoon. 
But before I do so, just very briefly, the context of Romans 4 here. Paul is, as I said a moment ago, de issuing, uh, dealing with the issue of salvation, how a man is justified before God. He actually began the chapter by speaking on Abraham, speaking on Abraham being an example of salvation by faith alone. He starts in verse 1, What then shall we say? What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So Paul holds forth Abraham, who was, we might say, the head of the Israelite nation, the first Jew, a holy man, a righteous man. And he says this man was justified. He was declared righteous in the sight of God by faith. Faith alone. And faith alone in its essence is resting. Resting upon the promises, the ability, the performance, and the power of God. As Paul says later on in the chapter, in verse 20, he says, Yet with respect to the promise of God, he, that is Abraham, did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. So what was Abraham's faith in? What was the essence of Abraham's faith? It was reliance upon God. It was reliance upon the power and the ability and the strength of God to save him. And specifically there to fulfill His promise that He gave Him. And therefore it was credited to Him as righteousness. So that's the example that Paul puts forth there at the beginning of Romans 4. And then he says this in verse 4. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. In other words, what he's saying is, if salvation is somehow by your work or mine, somehow by human effort, then there is no point in giving glory to God. There is no point in thanking God for anything. Even though Scripture says we are to give thanks to the Lord. We are to be grateful for the gift of salvation. And that follows logically, therefore, that the gift of salvation must be that. It must be a gift. Gifts are not things which we earn. They are things which are given to us. That's the nature of salvation. So Paul says that in verse 4. The one who works, what he gets for, because of his work is not regarded as a gift. So if we work for our salvation, it's no longer regarded as a gift. And therefore, whatever Scripture had to say concerning salvation would implode on itself because it would be contradictory. But as we know, it is all of grace. Because Paul follows that statement up in verse uh, 4, in verse 5. The verse that I want to focus on this afternoon, which speaks to the fact that salvation is not of the work of man, but it is of the work of God. Verse 5, he says, But to the one who does not work, this is the man who realizes something concerning God and concerning his own fallen state, that he is a sinner, that he is altogether a wretch, that he cannot earn righteousness before God for he has already transgressed his law. And friends, you and I are in that same state. You and I, by default, are lawbreakers, are at enmity with God. And therefore, salvation must be of grace. It must. It must be of us realizing that we cannot earn our own righteousness before God. We cannot procure it by our own religious works. Now to the one who does not work. As I said, he's contrasting this with what he said in verse 4. The one who works, what he receives, is not regarded as a gift. But listen to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is credited as righteousness. This man realizes that God is in the business of regarding the unrighteous as righteous. That is, He is in the business of saving sinners. My friends, Christ came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. What a glorious reality. That is the essence of the Gospel. 
For Jesus Himself said in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Friends, we are desperately lost. Spiritually bankrupt. Un unable to please God. As it says in Romans 8.8, 8, And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. It is an impossibility. That's why Christ is indispensable. That's why Christ is the only way. It's not some of Jesus and some of what you can provide. It is either all of Christ or it is not Christ at all. Jesus is jealous for the glory and salvation, friends. And that is why I call you to repent and to believe the Gospel. Repentance and faith in their very essence carry with themselves the idea of forsaking trust in self. Because we're no longer looking to ourselves, we're looking to Christ. As Jesus said in John 3, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. But going back to Romans 4, 5, But to the one who does not work, he ceases from his labors. He ceases from his striving and he trusts that Christ has procured eternal redemption. And that he need not add to it. It is an offense, it is an affront to God for us to try and add something that we can do to the work of Christ. It is an affront and an offense unto God. It is by faith alone in the mediator. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. No priests, no pastors, not the Pope. Christ. Christ is the head of the church. Christ is the mediator between God and man. But to the one who does not work, but, what does he do? So that's the negative aspect. He ceases from labor. He does not work. But what does he do? What does he do? He does something. He believes in Him who justifies the ungodly. He believes in God. He believes in the character of God. That as Scripture says, God forgives sin. God is abounding in grace and loving kindness and truth. Why? Why can God, how can God forgive sin? This is a dilemma. For we know from the proverb that those who justify the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. Those who justify the wicked are an abomination to God. Yet what does the text say? God justifies the wicked. How can this be? Because if God is a holy God, He cannot forgive you and me. He cannot let us go. He must see to it that we are punished in hell for our sin. How can that be that God is a holy God, yet He administers grace? It is because of the work of Christ. Do you see that? That Christ upon the cross bears the wrath of the Father. He purchases forgiveness of sin for His people. And so God can be both gracious and just in His saving sinners. That is why the text says, God justifies the ungodly. The one who places their faith in this God, in the true God, and in His ability to do this, and in His ability to justify sinners. What does it say? His faith is credited as righteousness. This phrase that Paul employs is very similar to the one that he used in verse 3 when he said, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Which is a quotation out of Genesis 15.6. Paul wants the reader to understand this. He wants the reader to grasp this reality. That when someone believes in God for salvation, the righteousness of Christ is given to them. They are credited with having lived Christ's life. They are regarded as having performed as Christ Himself performed. 
They are given the perfect garment of His righteousness which He procured through His perfect obedience. See, Christ, many people know Jesus died for His people, but He also lived for His people. He lived for His elect. He obeyed on their behalf so that the Father could credit that obedience to His people. He could regard them as having been obedient as Christ was. That's the exchange of the Gospel. That's the heart of the Gospel. That Christ takes upon His shoulders my sin and bears it at the cross, bears the wrath of God due unto it, and then I in turn receive His righteousness. I am credited with having lived His life. I am credited with having performed as He Himself performed. That's the beauty, that's the heart, that's the glory of the Gospel. That is the heart of the Christian faith. That's the, that's the essence of the Christian faith. And if you have had any other conceptions about Christianity, about as to what is the heart of Christianity, about to, as to what is Christianity all about, the wrong. This is the essence of biblical Christianity. His faith is credited as righteousness. Listen to the testimony of the Apostle Paul later on in the New Testament. In the book of Philippians, he gives his own personal testimony. I'll begin in verse 1 of Philippians 3. He says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and is a, it, and it is a safeguard to you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. So Paul here gives his own personal testimony before Christ. He says, I myself had a righteousness of my own, we might say. I performed very well. I was a good religious man. Surely God would regard me as holy. Of course we know from Scripture that that is not true. But listen to what he says, verse 7, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. What was the Apostle's Paul, the Apostle Paul's hope for heaven? It was in the righteousness of Christ. It was in the righteousness of Jesus Christ that was given to him by faith. Faith in the promises of God. You must contemplate this, friend. I exhort you to repent and to believe this truth. To believe, to believe this reality. This is true and this is glorious. That God justifies the ungodly because of the righteousness of His dear Son, because of the righteousness of the Redeemer, Christ Jesus our Lord. This God, who made all things, is holy, 
Holy is the triune God, the God whose name is Yahweh, who revealed Himself in Scripture as the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. The Eternal One, the Immutable God, the All-Knowing, All-Powerful, All-Present, Holy One. He is just. He is righteous. Righteous in all His ways. Perfect in all His deeds. And you must understand that. You must know that. He is so, so holy. Listen to Isaiah. Isaiah the prophet is writing here in Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6 verse 1. Listen to the way the prophet describes the holiness, the purity, the separateness of God that God has set apart from all that is perverse and wicked. Verse 1. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of His robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above Him, each having six wings. With two He covered His face, and with two He covered His feet, and with two He flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of Him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So even these angelic beings there in heaven are crying out to one another as it were in shock in all of the glory of God and they say holy 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 that's the character of God God is patient he is slow to anger he is abounding in loving kindness and truth as we know from Exodus chapter 36 we know from 1 John 4 8 that God is love as well and we even see that in, in its manifestation toward the wicked, that God shows a general love even toward the ungodly, even toward the unholy. However, these attributes of God are not in disagreement with one another, or they're not as if we can pick the ones that make us feel comfortable and, the, and ignore the rest. Friends, we must deal with the God of glory as He presents Himself in Scripture to us. And this God is the true God. Are there more gods than one? There is but one only. The, the living, true God. And in his, in his Holiness, in His perfection, God gave His law, His Ten Commandments. If you've, if you've grown up in a religious atmosphere, perhaps you yourself are familiar with these commands that God gave. But I wanted to tell you something about these commands that you probably have not heard before in church. And it is probably one of the most important things we must understand about God's law. God's law was given to us for the express purpose of showing us His character. Of showing us His holy character. That's the, that's the reason God's law was given. One of the reasons. For we find, for example, in Exodus chapter 20 is where the, the Ten Commandments are first given. In verse 13 He says, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. These commands put before us the character of God. They quite literally spell it out. Show us that God is not a liar, not a thief. He hates murder. My friends, that's the character of the God with whom we must deal. But not only that, we have to see something else. God's law is like a mirror and we look into it, we see God's character and then we see also our character in light of His character. Our sinful state in light of His holiness. Thank you. We see 
our character in light of the character of God. Let me ask you, friend, and I say that because I care for you. I truly care for you. I wouldn't come out here if I did not care for you. But listen, friend. God has said you shall not murder. You say, well, I've never murdered. Jesus says in Matthew 5, if you have anger in your heart toward your brother, God sees you as a murderer. The other command God gave, you shall not commit adultery. You say, I've never committed adultery. Jesus says in Matthew 5 that if you look with lust, you've committed adultery already in your heart. See, my friends, God sees the heart. He sees the mind. He sees the intents of the heart. And He does not in see intrinsic goodness. He does not see a built-in righteousness. He sees that man is utterly, totally depraved. There is no neutrality. Man is not born in neutrality. He is born in sin. The psalmist said in Psalm 51, In sin did my mother conceive me. Listen to Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. It says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This is the nature of man. You shall not steal. Have you, my friend, stolen? If so, God holds you accountable for having broken His law. Have you yourself borne false witness against your neighbor? Have you lied before? For we know from the book of Revelation that all liars will have their place in the lake of fire. And so therefore, because of our sin, we are in a state of hopelessness, helplessness. And we are held accountable by God. And therefore, we deserve hell. Deserve to go to the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The place that has been reserved for Satan and his demons. Jesus talked about hell more than He did about heaven. For He Himself loved sinners and desired to warn them of the impending wrath, the impending judgment. And likewise, I desire to make known this reality. For this is true. This is truth, friends. This is truth. This is true. That mankind by default is headed for destruction. Eternal destruction in hell. But blessed be God that He has shown great mercy. That He is rich in mercy. The Father, the first person of the Trinity, before the foundation of the earth was laid, he chose a people to Himself. As Paul says in Ephesians 1.5, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will to the praise of the glory of His grace. And the Father into, entered into compact with the Son, entered into covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ concerning the souls of the elect, concerning the people of God, he commissioned him to come and to die for this miserable lot. And Jesus agreed to do so. And he therefore would receive the full reward of his sufferings. He would be exalted to the right hand of the Father in glory. And he would reign as king. He would reign upon the throne of his father David. Christ agreed. And so God made the world. And much time went by. And then, my friends, when the fullness of the times came, Jesus came into the world. Christ came into the world to save sinners. The eternal God veiled His glory, as it were, and took upon Himself the form of a servant, became flesh and blood. Paul describes it this way in the book of Philippians, in Philippians chapter 2. He says concerning Christ in verse 6, who although He existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied Himself, taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
Christ Jesus came into the world and lived that life those three decades on earth and fulfilled the law of God on behalf of His people. See, my friends, God requires of us in order to be in a right standing before Him, He requires of you and I perfect law keeping, perfect obedience to His sovereign will, to His will as it is revealed in the Word of God. For God has said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you are to love your neighbor as yourself. But friend, have you done this for even a split second in your life? Have you even for a split second loved God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and loved your neighbor as yourself? No, neither have I. But Christ comes in and completes that, fulfills that totally. He obeys, He, he submits, He loves the Lord as God with all His heart, mind, soul, and strength, and He loves His neighbor as Himself. Jesus fulfilled the law for His people. He fulfilled all righteousness. This is glorious. This is precious to the heart of the believer. And then He laid Himself down as the Lamb of God. And He was beat. He was spat upon. He was made a public mockery. And He died upon the cross for His people. He bore the sins of His people. He took ownership, as it were, of their rebellion, of their iniquity. And paid for it for the wrath of the Father against it. Listen to what Isaiah 53 says, which was written seven centuries, 700 years before Jesus was born. It says in Isaiah 53, verse 3, He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, He was despised and we did not esteem Him. Surely our griefs He Himself bore, and our sorrows He carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him. And by His scourging we are healed. Verse 10. Before I read verse 10, we just saw in those previous verses, He bore the sins of His people. He took ownership of their rebellion, of their lying and their thievery. Even though He Himself was innocent, was treated by the Father as guilty. He bore the infinite, holy, just wrath against us in our sin. The wrath of God that is rightly against the wicked. That was even against God's own people. Verse 10, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. This is the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ, my friends. This is the heart of the Christian faith. If you say that you are a Christian, but you do not know this, this is not central to you then I would submit to you that you're not one. Friends, this is the heart of the Gospel, that Christ died to save sinners. The Gospel is not God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. The Gospel is that He came, Christ came, to save us from sin. For His own glory, for His own praise and honor. My friends, the cross was not only a demonstration, a revelation of the righteous the justice, the holiness, the wrath of God, but it is also, my friends, a demonstration of the love of God, the mercy of God, the kindness of God. Paul says in Titus that the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared. 
that is in the person and work of Jesus Christ, it is in Christ alone. Exclusively in Christ alone. And Jesus did not remain dead, but He was raised on the third day. The Father rose Him up as the public display that He had received His atoning work upon the cross as a sufficient payment for sin. That Christ had truly procured redemption. And also the resurrection of Christ was a vindication of Christ. For He did not die as a guilty man. He died as an innocent man regarded as guilty. Treated as if guilty. He was truly God, truly man. He never sinned once. The sinless Christ, the holy Christ, did not deserve what He received. His people deserved what He received. But He in grace bore it upon Himself. He was raised from the dead on that third day. On that Lord's Day morning. Romans 4.25 says, He who was delivered over because of our transgressions, that is, to put away our sin, but listen to this, and was raised because of our justifications. That is, again, the Father de declared, as it were, through that glorious act that He had received Christ's atonement. And that salvation for the people of God had been procured, had been purchased, had been brought about. As, Jesus, as, uh, as Paul himself says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. Jesus, after 40 days of further ministry among His disciples, ascended into glory. Bodily ascended into heaven. From the top of the Mount of Olives, He ascended into glory. And Scripture says in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 1 and in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2, that He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high. And that is significant, friend. That is very significant. For in the Old Testament, high pri or priests, for that matter, in the temple had no place to sit, no place to rest, for their work was continual day after day. However, Christ comes on the scene as high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And He sits down because His work has been completed. The work of Jesus Christ is enough to save you from your sin, my friends. So believe upon Christ. Repent. Flee sin and flee to the Savior. As the old hymn says, Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. That must be your heart. A heart of humility. A heart of brokenness. A heart of desperation. Poverty of spirit. Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poverty of spirit. We must realize that we are poor, miserable wretches. And we have nothing to offer God. But that God has all that we ever need. He has provided sufficient righteousness, sufficient forgiveness, a perfect, eternal salvation. That is the glorious Gospel. That Christ died and was buried and was raised on the third day on behalf of sinners according to the Scriptures. And so in light of this reality, in light of this truth, God commands all men everywhere to repent. Jesus Himself said in Mark 
The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That is what you must do, my friends, is repent and believe the gospel. Repentance is simply realizing that we are sinners. Accepting that fact. But not only that, but it is an endeavor to flee it. To flee sin. To turn from it. Whatever sin you are enslaved to, to walk away from it. Pornography, drunkenness, drug abuse, pride, anger, hatred, malice, a detestation of the things of God. Whatever sin, my friends, repentance turns from it. And then belief, that is taking God at His Word, relying upon the strength and power of God to save you. Saving faith, as I said earlier, is reliance upon God, reliance upon the power of God. It is reliance upon God. Taking God at His Word. Saying, as it were, Oh God, I know what You have said in Your Word concerning Your Son, and I believe it. I believe that He is sufficient to save me from my sin, and therefore I embrace Him. On His terms and not my own. That is what faith says. True saving faith. And these things are not things which you yourselves can conjure up or bring about. They are things that are given by God as a gift. Something that God grants to man. Salvation is the work of God in man, not the work of man toward God. So for those who repent and believe, their sins are forgiven. Past, present, and future. All of it because of the all-sufficient work of Christ. And they are wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. They are regarded as having lived His life. They are treated as if they performed as Christ performed. Obeyed as He obeyed. Jesus takes my sin upon His shoulders and I receive His righteousness as a gift. That is the glorious great exchange. The beautiful Gospel. The Gospel has such a luster, such a beauty to it. Friends, believe it. Believe this Gospel of grace. It is all by grace, not by the works of the law. As Paul says there in Romans 4, 4, or excuse me, Romans 4, 5, but to the one who does not work, but believes in Him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. It is grace. It is unmerited favor. That's what the Bible says over and against the Roman Catholic Church or the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons which all say that it is by faith plus work. Yeah, it's by grace, but you've got to do something yourself as well. Scripture stands in strong opposition to such doctrines of demons. Salvation is all of the free grace of God. And for those who have been saved, for those who have been saved by Christ, for those who have been redeemed by His work, they are not only justified before God, but in this life, on a practical level, they are changed. Because they now have new hearts and new desires, new inclinations, new intentions. They are made new. In fact, Paul says it this way, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. The old man, with his old affections and old actions, is dead. And the new man has come, as it were. Unconverted people hate the things of God. Prayer, the Word of God. They love to sin, love to live in sin. However, when someone is changed by the grace of God, they now desire to walk in holiness, desire the Word of God, desire prayer, desire the fellowship of the saints, desire to hear biblical preaching, to worship God in the context of the local church. Why? Because God has given them new desires, new intentions. He has made them new. 
He's made them new. It is all of grace. In fact, this salvation procures such a change that Jesus says in Matthew 7, these words, verse 16, You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is, thrown, is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Friends, if you claim to be a Christian, my challenge to you is to examine your life. Don't examine, well, that you profess to be a Christian, because just about everyone in America says they're a Christian. That's not it. That's not it. Those who have been changed by the power of God are new creations. They now live differently. They now think differently. They now talk differently. They're new. Listen to what Jesus says, verse 21, in that same chapter, Matthew 7, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Friends, dear friends, listen, this is important concerning your soul. You must look at your life. Do you bear fruit? Do you bear good fruit? If not, you're lost. You're self-deluded. You're deceived. And you need to repent and believe the Gospel. But if you see that God has done a work in your life, praise God, brethren. Feed upon the Gospel. Rest in it every day. It's the Gospel not only for the lost, but for the child of God. Therefore, abide in it and proclaim it to this lost and dying and sick world. This dead world that they might be raised to spiritual life. It is by grace, all that God might receive the glory, all to the end that God might be praised and honored and exalted above all. That is the purpose of the creation of the world, not just salvation, but all things. The glory of God. It's not about you or me. It is about the glory of God. Paul, after thoroughly touching on the issues of salvation and God's sovereignty over salvation, says in Romans chapter 11, verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became His counselor? Or who is first given to Him that it might be paid back to Him again? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things... To Him be the glory forever. Amen. Indeed, to God be the glory forever. Amen. You lost souls. You unconverted people. Both men and women alike. You need to repent. To flee sin and to believe upon Christ alone. To believe the Gospel. The Gospel of God's wonderful, life-changing grace. You who say you know Christ, you need to examine yourselves to see, has God done a work in your life? Look at your actions. Look at what you think about most, for that is your God. Do you care anything about the things of God, or are you just a hypocrite? If you're a hypocrite, then you fall into the first category of people I just addressed. You need to be saved. However, if you are truly regenerate, if God has done a work of grace in your life then you must feed upon the Gospel and you must not depart from it. Anyone who does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Friends, brethren, you must rest upon the Gospel and go and preach it. Proclaim it to this lost and dying world. By His grace and for His glory. We have seen here in Romans chapter 4, verse 5, that for the one who does not work, but believes that God can justify and that God does justify the ungodly. 
He is credited with the righteousness of Christ. God is so holy and righteous, He gave His law, but we broke it. And you know this, your own conscience tells you concerning this. And we deserve hell. But Christ bore hell upon the cross for His people. The wrath of the Father against their sin. And He rose on the third day. And all who repent and believe the Gospel are saved from their sin, are forgiven on account of, right, uh, uh, on account of Christ's work. All by His grace and all for His glory. To Jesus Christ be all the glory in all things forevermore. Amen and Amen.